Art is more than painting. It's more than writing. Art could be crochet, cooking, conversation. It could be a lot of different things. Art is important, but the most important part of it is that we do it. Not just appreciate it, not just look at it, but actively engage in it. Because art reminds us that we can change our world. Let's talk about embodying art and art as a sacred practice. Today, as we walk together down creation's path. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian. I am a Christopagan Druid and sous chef to the Danto. Today, we're gonna to be talking about embodying art or art as a sacred practice. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, especially as a practitioner of creation spirituality. And a theme that we will be returning to over and over and over again. And if you actually look back at the older episodes, we've talked about it before, but given the current state of the world, I think it's more important than ever to talk about this time. But before we do, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app that you're currently listening to this podcast on. It does help us out, but it also helps you because we do five original Christo Pagan and Druid episodes Monday to Friday every week. And you don't want to miss anything that we're working on because we got a lot of cool stuff coming up. And well, I think we're all going to have to need to sharpen our practice over the next four years or so. We also take listener feedback and have several episodes in the past and several episodes coming up in the not too distant future that were topics that some of the members wanted us to talk on. Let us know what you want us to, to be f focusing on and let's just get into it. One of the hardest things for us sometimes to realize is that we can affect reality. Some of that is because we have been contaminated either by fantastical representations of magic where a witch snaps their fingers and a flame appears in the air like a, like they're holding an in invisible candle and yeah, stuff like that doesn't happen. Or grifters push a certain kind of magical thinking that as so always you think hard enough, you could just make things magically appear in the universe. And yeah, no, that kind of doesn't happen either. I say kind of because there's a giant asterisk on that, but that's part of what we're talking about today. The way all magic and creative effort works is through a lot of inborn processes where you have to consider, think, conceive, work on a methodology, but then output it into the universe in some way, shape, or form. One of the biggest problems I have with the manifestation movement is so much of it is, it's all in your mind, and no, no, dreams are all in your mind. But magic isn't. When they're spoken, acted on, and yeah, yeah it's not, your mind is your mind. A lot of things happen in there, but this isn't a world in which you can just think your way to a better reality. You have to actually take action. It's why we have the two mantras that we chant over and over and over again on here. Faith without works is dead and better is better. These go hand in hand. And there's something that we say over and over and over again, because it's so easy for people, especially with a faith practice, a magical practice or a mystical practice to just expect that, well, I said a few magical words of prayer. So everything's fine. A third one that we like to talk about around here is recognizing and breaking free of those mental shackles that have been passed down through the generations that we've inherited today. One of the big ones that I see a lot of people struggling with nowadays, and including myself, I, at times I struggle with, is when capitalism wanted to commoditize and commercialize, push forward art, they tried to make it only for a special select group to help boost its value so it could sell for more. And I'm not necessarily here to talk about art selling. We can make this really simple. The art the art market is a scam. It's NFTs, but with actual paintings. Definitely. There's too many starving artists out there. They need to be supported. That all said, in creating this special class that gets put up on this pedestal and away from everyone else, art got taken out of the hands of masses. So that nowadays you get psychological medical professionals going, there's this cool new thing about art therapy to help heal you. And it's like, technically that's been around since we put handprints on walls. Yep. Not we, but as in the collective we as in humanity. Yeah. Like like many, many eons ago. It, it's been around forever. 
yes, art is magic. It is healing and everyone can do it. Yes, some are more trained and do it a lot better than others. Trust me, I'm definitely a stick figure side of things. But when it comes to drawing, that is, I uh, cannot draw. Oh, my plating pictures were horrific and needed a lot of text to clarify what was where on the plate. But once again, everyone's art is different and it's personal and it, everybody can do it. And the power of taking art away from us is in, it keeps us from remembering that we can change the world. We can materially change the world. If you're playing with clay and by the way, the, the lost art of working with salt clay, like. It's really easy. Get yourself some flour, some salt, and some water. Make yourself some Play-Doh. It's really easy. There are a thousand recipes online, and flour is cheap and easy to get. You don't have to find a special store that sells just the right kind of clay and worry about all the different ramifications of all the different kinds of clay. Get yourself some flour, some salt, and some water. Make yourself some Play-Doh. You can cure it in your own oven if you want to keep it. Put a sealant on it. It'll last for a really long time if you want it to. In manipulating that Play-Doh, that clay, in, in painting something, in crocheting something, in writing something, in singing, we are actively changing the world. It is reminding us of the effect that we can have on our physical reality. That clay was a lump, you turned it into a bird. The air was still and you filled it with song. Whether that's playing a musical instrument or just singing in your car on your way to and from work. That piece of paper was blank until you wrote words on it. That screen was just a blinking cursor, not moving until you literally changed the electrons inside the machine by putting words in there. Art is the reminder that we can physically change this world. And we can spiritually change this world. Paintings, books, stories, a good meal have an emotional and spiritual and psychological effect on people. That's the thing. As, as a chef, I'm literally taking a hunk of dead meat, dead vegetables, and uh, some starches, generally dead also, combining it and breathing life into it and creating something that enlivens those that partake, that share in it. All acts of creativity are magical acts. And as you know, I'm on this huge quest to get us to re-enchant our disenchanted world. And we have to understand that. Whether you believe in all the woo-woo stuff that I do or not, I don't care. I have a friend who might even be listening right now who can take the yarn or any kind of threaded something and make the most amazing fiber crafts out of it in what to me feels like no time. Like I know how long it takes me to crochet something or to knit something and she can just magically make it happen. It just like, what pattern did you use? Oh, I just kind of was riffing and this is what I came up with. That's magic. That's powerful magic. That is changing the world. That was just a skein of thread. It was just a ball of yarn. Now it's this beautiful thing, a vest, a, a garment of some sort or whatever, right? That magical transformation that happens. When you realize what you're doing there, whether it's cooking a meal, taking these very bland ingredients. If you've never eaten like straight up food, the difference between a raw carrot and a cooked carrot, the flavors are immense. We get to stuff like the broccoli and cauliflower. Tastes one way raw. Tastes one way if you cook it a little bit. Tastes a little way but different if you cook it a little bit more. If you cook it all the way, it tastes even further different. All these different grades of flavor that you can bring about as change. Having that remind you that you can have this effect. And it might seem small to you. You might be sitting there thinking, but Charlie, cooking a meal is not making changes in my community or in my city, county, state, country, whatever. Yes, it is the same thing. It, it's exactly the same thing. It has to start first with the idea. Idea gets filtered through methodology, which gets filtered through the process of doing it and then sharing it out there. That's what changes everything. And no, we might not be the one who writes the book that makes people start questioning the military industrial complex or racism or sexism or homophobia. Someone will write that book. Maybe a lots of someones will write that book because we know how various books over the years, 12 Years a Slave or The Jungle, affected people when they realized, wait, this is what life is. Wait, what? There are books scattered throughout our history. That's why we say better is better. And we repeat it over and over again so that it will stick in people's minds because 
on an individual level, when you engage in that creative act, in that act of art, in whatever form works for you, a lot of times you are still processing and helping your mind process thoughts, grief, whatever it is, whatever is weighing on you, it is still being processed in the background. You are making yourself better, which means then everyone that you interact with, those interactions will be better. Your relationships will be better. It just ripples out. It's about growing confidence and sharing. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite musicians slash activists is Leslie Gore. You might know her from such hits from the 50s as You Don't Own Me. Yeah, you know that? You know that song? Like, it's been used in a lot of movies lately, so we'll just stick with that one. But go back and listen to her music, especially her early stuff, the stuff that was recorded in the 50s. Even back then, she was really a powerless woman in a male-driven industry that had a cookie-cutter plan on how to make a female thought music star. She refused to sing the songs that she thought degraded women. It was a little, just a little thing. It's my party and I can cry if I want to. Think about the defiance of a song like that. Good girls don't cry. They don't ruin the party. They're the life of the party. 1950s after all, right? No, it's my party and I can cry if I want to. You don't own me. Legally, when she recorded that song, wives were the property of their husbands. Like, legally, that was not true. She stood her ground. She got to record the songs that she wanted to say. She went on to an amazing career as a left lesbian activist and a fe feminist activist. But it was born out of these little actions, these little things. You, you're not going to turn into this huge activist hero overnight. It takes these little steps. And when you look at old interviews with her, you can see how it was that little thing of she got the thing of like, my boyfriend told me to do this. I should do it. Because which, if you've listened to a lot of 50s music, that's a lot of the songs that female artists say. I'm here to make my boyfriend happy. She was like, no, I'm not recording that. I'm not doing that. It's these little actions that may not seem like a lot, but how many people who grew up with her music, when they went through those breakups, when they were going through those hard times with a very controlling partner, would put, oh, you don't own me. I'm not just one of your mini toys, right? You don't own me. They would sing that song with her and that defiance, that strength in her voice. They would take that into themselves. That's what art does. Our art reminds us that we can change the world. And when we put it out into the world, it reminds other people that they can be agents of change too. It strengthens everyone in the circle, everyone that gets to see it. And if you're like, but my craft is baking bread, send it to your friends. Make a whole bunch of bread and give it out to people. Make a whole bunch of bread and see if there's a soup kitchen in your town that needs it and find out what the requirements are and bake bread for them. Because the part of the magic is that is in the very first step, and that is doing it and getting to that point of done. It doesn't have to be a, a big, long process. Having that, that success releases dopamine. Yep. It has chemical happiness inside you, and it builds confidence. And each time you repeat that over and over again, it builds more confidence. The confidence actually makes the art even better. This is ha why art is so sacred. Because one, and again, I think this is going to be our next mantra that gets added to the list. Sacred does not mean solemn. Nope. We, we have allowed those two words to get confused for each other a lot. Sacred can be really silly. It can be goofy. Sacred can be erotic. Sacred can be sweet and gentle. And yes, it can be serious and solemn and somber. All of those things can be sacred. Sacred means set aside. It means this is special. This is so special that I'm putting safeguards around this so that it doesn't get abused. That can be taken to extremes. Don't give in to zealotry. Zealotry doesn't help anyone. That's what making art sacred is. Once you find out what it is, what is your art? Is it drawing, painting, cooking, conversation? Conversation is an art form. And a lot of people don't realize that listening is even an art form. Listening is a powerful, it's art, a powerful form. art form. So once you've discovered what your art form is, setting it aside as this is special. Now that doesn't mean that you don't just do frivolous art every now and then. You know what? Writing to me is sacred and I still use social media and I put some of the most frivolous things out there. Not every word I write is in that sacred art. I try to keep it that way. That's why I don't post as much as I probably should. Because I don't want to be 
a continuance or furtherance of a part of the problem. I'll see somebody say little social media and I just want to tear them down. And sometimes that needs to happen. And I have engaged in that from time to time. But sometimes just furthering an argument is just throwing wood on a fire. And that doesn't help anyone else. And that's the maturity that comes. But that's a whole different side issue. Yeah, just because you like drawing is your sacred art doesn't mean you can't doodle. You can still doodle. That doesn't have to, that every time doesn't have to be sacred. Again, sacred is not serious or solemn. Along with that, I think people often forget because we're supposed to be grown-ups, which means we do grown-up things and we no longer play. The thing is, is part of life is play. Play is actually practicing in a safe space those skills and things that we're going to do when we're in a more serious moment. So it is important to remember to leave play in there. Play helps us learn. We know this. Like the science is in. Play helps us learn. It helps us to relax and it helps us to process. And I think all of us need to do those three things right now. Very much so. This is why when you're figuring out what your art is and when you're engaging in it, remembering the, that there are those times of play. Yeah. There are times where I just have to be silly or let myself do a silly dish. I think back to the most recent one, which was pretty controversial, but I wanted to do some ribs and I decided to do non-traditional and I put the coffee rub on the ribs. And it was, it just like it, was, pork. it was clay. I knew I was the only one that was going to eat them anyhow. So it didn't matter. And I had a backup. So like, I wasn't, it wasn't like I was going to go hungry or anything, but it actually turned out an amazing experience. And the ribs experience. were on sale. So it's not like, yeah, the ribs were on sale, so it was, it was an expensive yeah, cut to yeah, try this out on. Yeah, was, well, sometimes <laughs> ribs are not cheap, but ribs were on sale. Yeah, they were on sale. It was, it was the season and, uh, they were on sale. So they were super cheap as well. And it yeah. was, it was. It was play. It was wonderful fun. And it didn't matter if it was successful or if it failed. That was the whole thing with play. I think we need to reimagine our entire spiritual life as play. I, I think play is so underrated. And if we do start seeing it that way, it helps us, one, not become super serious about it. I think the biggest bane, whether it's to your witchcraft practice, your pagan practice, your Christian practice, whatever is when it is, oh no, this is the most serious life or death, eternal stakes. No, no, no. And look, I, I know for any of the, any Christians that might be listening, you're like, but Jesus said you go to hell if you don't follow him. Uh, okay, so hell, Gehenna, was the place that everybody goes after death. See, we don't study the first century, so we don't know the context he's talking in. A lot of people who weren't Jewish heard him out of context and ran with their own ideas. Everybody goes to Gehenna when they die everybody. It's like the afterlife waiting room. You go there and you have to work through any of the traumas that you have. You work them out there. You can throw them into the fire. All the things that you're not going to take with you out of this world. That's why it's the, it's Gehenna. It's the refuse stump. You stop by the, the, by the, by the trash pit and you throw out all the things you're not going to need after that life. All of the pain, all of the hurt, all of the misery, all of the trauma. It all gets thrown into, into, into the fire. It all gets thrown into, into the trash pit. And then you go on to who knows what, because Jesus didn't talk about that. That's first century. That's the first century reality of what Jesus was talking about. So no, you had played a game of telephone with an idea. Nothing is, is eternal stakes here. I'm sorry. It's not. And if that kind of breaks your sense of reality, you really need to like, do a deep dive in what was first century Judaism that Jesus was living in and what was first, second, and third century Christianity. It's not until all these ideas hit the Greeks and the Romans that all this other stuff gets thrown on there because, you know, Hades and Tartarus. And I don't, I, I'm not a Hellenist. I'm sorry. I don't believe in Tartarus. I don't. And by the way, the word Tartarus is used in a lot of the early church fathers for hell. I don't believe in Tartarus. I'm not a Hellenist. So... There you go. And that's why we need to bring this sense of play in. Jesus had a sense of play. When he saw children, he went over and played with them. When his disciples were like, no, we have serious things going on. Keep the kids away. He's like, don't with the kids. No. And what would anybody who hurts the children? You remember that one too. He hung out at parties. They called him a drunkard. Because he was hanging out at the parties. Jesus's entire ministry was one of fun. Yes, he talked about things that helped people and he helped people work through things. But this is a man who was at all of the parties. He was playing with the kids. 
he was out there living a pretty good life for what he could in the first century. As an example for us, spirituality is not the solemn, locked away, buttoned up. No, no. That was the Therapeuti of the first couple centuries BC. And if you've never heard of them, look into them. They're kind of the first monks. And they actually existed before Christianity. But Christianity, the whole idea of monks and priesthood, really a lot of it comes from the ideas of the Therapeuti and from uh, a lot of Stoics and the way mystery cults operated in Rome. Sorry to burst any bubbles if you didn't know that, but that's the way it is. Spirituality is meant to make our lives better. Jesus himself said, I come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, for my burden is light. Does it sound like somebody who's trying to tell us to be all serious and somber and heart? No, no. That doesn't mean we never take anything seriously. Some things need to be taken seriously. But art, embodying our art, learning to live it, not just to make it, but to live it. What are the ideas that are pouring forth in this? What are the, the powers that are flowing forth through, through us? Learning to live that, one, reminds us we can't make change because again, at the end, you have a thing. Whether it's a sculpture, a plate of food, a good night out with your friends, a poem, a book, a short story, whatever. A garment, a tablecloth, a napkin, for goodness sake. At the end of the creative process, you have a thing. You physically change the world because you can change the world. And don't listen to anyone, anyone who tells you that you can't. And don't let anyone tell you that small changes don't matter. It's the small changes that make for big change. It took a lot of people for a lot of times changing a few people's minds here, there, and yonder to even get to the point where there was an abolitionist movement in this country. Because slavery had been unquestioned for thousands of years. And I want to remind you, the earliest Christian writers all said that slavery was opposed to God. God did not support slavery. They had to fake two books by Paul and force them into the Bible to get, keep slavery. Philemon and Titus, Paul did not write them. They're books that need to be thrown out of the Bible. They are not holy, they are not sacred, and no one should take them seriously. The whole point of both of these books is, no, nah, slavery's fine. In fact, slavery's good, actually. That's F Philemon. The whole book of, the, of Philemon is, yeah, slavery's fine, actually, because they didn't want to give up that power, because the Christian movement wanted to just end slavery. But there was a compromise in these fake texts, which, by the way, when I say that, they knew at the time they were fake. Eusebius calls them fake, and many of the early church fathers called them fake. How they still made it in is politics and problematic. Again, sacred doesn't mean perfect, but it took centuries after that of people going, you know, I really don't think slavery is a good idea. I really don't think that's a good idea. Here's the bad things. We're still fighting this fight today, but it's the small changes that get us to where we need to go and the small changes that add up to the big change. And if you're not working towards those small changes, if you're not building that art, if you're not embodying that art, if you're not putting that art out into the world, we're never going to get to the, that change. Let me shift your focus for a moment. One of the other major things with art, with engaging in art and in yourself, is engaging in art is a creative act. When you engage in a creative act, you're engaging in life and in being alive. Yep. And the big secret in life, the meaning, the actual meaning of life that everyone is seeking for is seeking that moment of aliveness, of being alive, that experience of being alive. Yep. And the big secret is it's as simple as doing art. Yeah. Which is why art is so healing. It's why it's so rejuvenating. And it's why it's just a wonderful thing if it's allowed to just be and to do. Because it is an act. <laughs> I, I probably sound a little worked up. I think my accent came out a bit in here. I don't try to cover it up. I just, over the years, I've lived in a lot of different places. And so my inborn accent doesn't come out that much. I can hear it right now as I'm talking. I don't know how much of it's going to make it onto the recording. Because sometimes I hear it more in my head than I can finish <laughs> recording. It's not so, quite as thick. We haven't pulled out the old wooden pulpit either. But we need to get fired up. I get it. If you're still upset about everything, if you're still processing, process, be upset. But make art work through that write a short story write a poem just journal it out just make some make some splatter paintings 
But the one thing we have to do is be creative. And I'm going to end this episode on this. Creation is the opposite of destruction. Let's we'll say that again. Creation is the opposite of destruction. There are going to be people out there that are telling you that now is the time to be destructive. And that is wrong. Yeah, sometimes you have to take things apart, but that's because you're going to harvest the best parts of them and throw the rest of it away. Creativity requires construction. It is not a destructive process. And as long as we stay on the side of that constructive process, and yeah, we're going to have to dismantle a lot of stuff. Don't get me wrong. Destruction is always the last option, and it's very rarely ever a viable one. We are going to win. We're going to build the world that we want to see by creating it together. I would also say destruction is always tempered with recognizing impermanence. Well, that's the thing. When, if we do our jobs right, and we can see this in the poll numbers, no matter what anybody's telling you about what's going on right now, we lost because of apathy and misinformation. That, that, that's what happened. Nobody signed on to all of the evil, dark, bad things. Well, some people did, but the very minority of people did. It was apathy and misinformation. The way you defeat apathy and misinformation is to plug people in and to properly inform. Them. That's it. Showing that we have truth on our side, like Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and the many, many, many people throughout history who have done that is how we went. The Stonewall Rebellion was a moment. It didn't change history. I think people need to re remember that. It did not change history. What changed history was after the Stonewall Rebellion, when all those people were sitting afterwards and decided we should organize. That organization, that creative act is what changed history. It wasn't the rebellion. It was the organization and the commitment to push through and to push forward and to push the cause. Because it wasn't the first riot. There have been riots before. There was actually around the same time a riot in LA over the same reasons, exact same setup and everything. It's like a complete replay. And we don't remember it because they didn't organize afterwards. The actual change of history wasn't the riot. It was the organizing that happened afterwards. And the year later, when the first Pride March happened, that's what we have to remember. The riot was an act of pure frustration, but it's not what changed the world. It was the artwork that came after it, the creation of the pride flags, the creation of the slogans, the creating of the movement, the conversation, the talking points. It was the creativity that changed the world. And that's what we need to be working on today, embodying that art, setting it aside as a sacred practice and getting to the goals that we need to get to. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something from it. I would love to know what your personal art form is. And don't worry if you think it's silly. I want to see some silly responses. Actually, there you go. Only silly responses. I don't want anybody telling me they're serious. I do this, mate. No, no, only serious responses. And if you don't think you have a silly response, do some soul searching. You do. You're just not letting yourself know you have one. That could be good for a professional artist out there. Because I know yes. we have professional artists that listen. It's a challenge. Yes. To what the silly responses are. What is the silly <laughs> response? Only, only serious responses, please. Yeah. You got to normalize being silly. Yeah. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say that you can leave a comment, they won't let us know. So go ahead and leave a comment there. It helps with engagement. And then go over to creationspaths.com, click on chat, and you can leave a comment there. And we will see it and be able to respond to you. While you're there, if you have any money, you can pass our way. Reflu does help us out a lot. Helps us to pay the bills, keep the lights on, keep food on our table and a roof over our heads. You can sign up for a membership there, or you can support us on Patreon or Ko-fi. I'm CE Dorset on both. And if you don't have any money that you can give right now, but you want to support us, share the episodes with people that you know and help us get the word out. That helps us more than you can imagine. And we need to be doing that for each other more and more and more. Any message that you like from anybody, not just from us, share it. Be creative about how you share it. Make sure people know. Let's make the good things prosper. Alrighty, thank you for watching. And as we're going out today, I think the only thing that I can do is, oh, blessed Shatina, the divine presence of God who helped to guide our ancestors through the wilderness as a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, who stood in the temple with such brilliance that Solomon was afraid to enter, that glowed in the deserts, in the tabernacle, so bright, everyone knew that the presence of God was there. Oh, divine wisdom, enlighten us and teach us our crafts. For you say of yourself, 
I played before God before the creation of the world. Teach us to play as you do and teach us the wisdom of the, your ways so that we may create a better world together. Amen. And remember, have fun with it.